In a previous video, we looked at how to conduct a one-way ANOVA. In that video, we looked at how to determine if we had strong evidence for a, an ANOVA test and how to draw a conclusion. However, we've seen that with a one-way ANOVA, if we have strong evidence for a result, that all we can say is that there is strong evidence against the null hypothesis, meaning there is strong evidence that at least one of the group means differs. So here we're going to introduce a new example uh, comparing popular diets. We're going to do the ANOVA analysis, but then we're going to see how we can follow up and get maybe a little more satisfying results than just at least one mean it differs. So in this example, researchers conducted a study involving four popular diets. The Atkins diet, which is a very low carb diet. The Zone diet, which is a ratio of carbs, protein to fat, and the ratio is 4, 30 to 30. The Learn diet, which is high carb and low fat. And the Ornish diet, which is low fat. In this study, the researchers randomly assigned 311 female volunteers, all between the ages of 25 to 50, and all with a BMI in the range of 27 to 40, so they were all in the obese range. These female participants were randomly assigned to only one of the four diets, which they had to maintain for the course of a year. After a year, the researchers calculated the change in the BMI, which means that if uh, the change was negative, that means that the participant had a reduction in BMI, which is a good thing. That means that they um, had a healthy or good result. So we are going to test the null hypothesis that the mean for the Atkins diet equals the mean for the zone diet equals the mean for the learned diet equals the mean for the Ornish diet. So we will define our parameters. So this is where mu a, uh, mu a, mu z, mu l, and mu o are the true mean reductions, I should say uh, true mean changes, because we don't want to necessarily assume that it's going to be a reduction, in BMI for women between 25 and 50 years old on the Atkins zone learn and Ornish diets respectively. So we're saying that the true mean changes in BMI for women on each of these diets is the same our null hypothesis. That is, it doesn't matter what diet you're on, you're going to lose the same weight or you're going to have the same change in your BMI no matter what. The alternative hypothesis says at least one mean is going to be different from the others. So that means that at least one of those diets is going to have a different change in BMI than the rest. It could be that all four of them differ. It could be that only one of them differs. It could be that two of them have a different BMI than the rest. The alternative hypothesis is going to be as general and nonspecific as possible, and that's the best way to negate the null hypothesis. All right? So this is just like how we would write a alternative hypothesis for multiple regression. We're just saying at least one of the parameters differs, and we'll do a follow-up analysis later to figure out which one. Here we have a plot of the sample change in BMI, so each point represents uh, an individual's change. So this point here is one specific woman on the learn, this point here is one specific woman on Ornish, and so on. So based on this plot, for the 311 total women in the study, we can see that there are some differences on average in the changes, but overall it doesn't seem like those differences are that big. So on average, the change for the women on the Atkins diet is lower than that for the learn, the Ornish, and the zone, and the change in the zone diet is higher or more positive than for zone than any of the other four diets. So because a negative average is better, that the change in BMI um, uh, before to after is more, is, is better, so women did better under that Atkins diet. Um, we can see that the zone diet maybe had the least good effect and the Atkins diet had the most good effect because we want more negative changes. Um, but even so, the, the effects themselves don't seem that big. 
So we're going to keep that in mind. So we're going to conduct our ANOVA analysis. We've identified our hypotheses in this step. The next thing we want to do is state our assumptions. So we need a normal response uh, in each group. Well, we don't have a histogram. Histogram. So we don't know if this has been satisfied. So we'll have to just assume that the change in BMI is a normal or follows a normal distribution no matter what diet you're on. We also need equal standard deviations of the response in each group. So that means that the change of BMI has the same standard deviation uh, for the Atkins, the Learn, and the Ornish, and the Zone diet. We don't have the standard deviations, um, but what I do have, uh, sorry, this is not the standard error. This is the standard deviation. And the standard deviations in all four of these groups, so this is a typo here, so make sure that in your notes you fix this. The standard deviations for all four groups uh, range from 0 .0, 2.0 to 2.5. They're all pretty similar. So the standard deviations are all similar. So check, we're good there. We need uh, independent and random samples. This has been satisfied. We did this through random assignment. This was a completely randomized design. So because this was a completely randomized design, everyone was assigned to only one group and it be, they were randomly assigned to only one group. So we've got the randomization and we've got the independence. We need a quantitative response and a categorical predictor that has been satisfied. We've got change in BMI, which is quantitative, and we've got type of diet, which is categorical. So we are good. We've already stated our hypotheses. So the next thing we need to do is get our test statistic and p-value. p-value. Our test statistic and p-value are provided in the ANOVA table. Our F statistic is 3.8001. This means we have 3.8 times as much explained variability when we use the type of diet to predict the change in BMI as we do unexplained variability. That's not that big, right? But that kind of makes sense. We don't have a very big effect. Our sample means are not that different from one each other. Right? When we look at this plot, the sample means are all pretty close and the variability within each group is very large. So the difference between our group means is small relative to the variability within each group. So it makes sense that our F statistic isn't huge. Our P value is small. The probability of getting a test statistic like this or bigger, if there were no difference, in the change in BMI across all four diets is 0 0.01. We'd see something like this about 1% of the time if all the diets were the same in terms of change of BMI. So we have a small p-value even though we have a pretty small effect and that's really just because of our sample size. So what do we conclude? There is strong evidence against the null hypothesis of no difference between diets in change in BMI, but there is a low F statistic and small differences in the sample means so the change or the effect may be small. So remember, this is that holistic sort of decision we want to make, not just looking at the p-value, right? We don't want to just say we have a small p-value, therefore there is a relationship because that's a very deterministic result response. 
based on this sample, which is very large. We do have evidence against the null hypothesis, but there's also some uncertainty about whether, you know, the results we have are really that meaningful and whether they would hold up under another test. But it's still worth following up. So because we do have evidence against the null that some of our means differ, or at least one of our means differs, we can now do a follow-up analysis. I'm going to repeat that because we have evidence against the null hypothesis, we can do a follow-up analysis. So only because we have evidence to indicate that at least one of our means differs, we can now proceed and do confidence intervals to investigate which group means differ. The confidence intervals we're going to do are a lot like the ones that we saw in section 10. We're going to compare two means at a time. In section 10, we did a two sample interval for means. In section 10, we had independent random samples. We had the same uh, assumptions otherwise, except for in section 10, we only had two means. And so our confidence intervals looked like y1 bar minus y2 bar plus or minus t star times the standard error of the difference between two means. In our case, so when following up ANOVA, we use jump. So this is only when two groups, when there are more than two groups, we can't use this uh, formula because the standard error is actually going to be smaller. So we will use jump to determine this and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. So our question, is there a large effect on BMI reduction, for example, when comparing the Atkins and the LEARN diet? What would that confidence interval look like? Well, it's still going to be estimating mu LEARN minus mu A. And so the form is going to be Y bar LEARN minus Y bar A plus or minus some T star times the standard error of Y bar LEARN minus Y bar A. Now, the reason why I did learn minus Atkins is because that's the order that jump is going to do it because jump always makes the differences positive. Now, before, jump would do it in reverse alphabetical order, but now jump is going to do things in an order difference report and jump is going to specifically do that so the differences are always positive and that's just to keep things interpretable. So it's going to take the larger group mean minus a smaller group mean. And so the way to read this is level minus level. So group one minus group two to make the difference positive. The next column is the standard error of the difference. So here we have y bar L minus y bar A. Here we have the standard error of y bar L minus y bar A. You would need to find T star. The T star has degrees of freedom from error, of error from the ANOVA table. But you don't need to do this by hand because JUMP also gives you the lower and upper bounds for the 95% confidence limit, uh, confidence interval. So this whole interval here, Y bar L minus Y bar A plus or minus our critical value times the standard error is 0 0.042 up to 1.416. So to inter uh, interpret this, there is 95% confidence that the true mean change in BMI for women on LEARN versus the Atkins diet is between 0 0.042 up to 1.416. BMI doesn't have units, so we can leave it there. Now we might want to think about this. Does this contain zero? No. But is it a big effect? 
So remember, we don't want to think about just whether it contains zero, but also how far it is from zero. A change in BMI of five is pretty big. If you lose five BMI points, and you're, you're doing pretty well. But these were women in the 27 to 50, uh, 27 to 40 range in terms of BMI. And so if the change in BMI or if the difference in change in BMI is only between 0 0.042 and 1, is there really a meaningful difference if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to get healthy, if you're an overweight, uh, if you're an overweight person between these two diets? Not really. The smallest effect, the smallest difference is not even one whole unit, not even one-tenth of a BMI point. And the biggest change is one and a half BMI points. But again, if you're overweight, if you're at a BMI of 27, the smallest uh, BMI that allow for you to be included in the study, you're really not seeing that big of a difference. So I would argue that this is not that big of an effect. So it's basically, you can choose whichever one of these diets are easier to stick to in, in terms of the difference that you're going to see. So that's just comparing one of those groups, but JUMP is nice and it will compare all four groups for you at the same time. So that was one T interval. The 95% T confidence intervals to compare all means are going to be called the Fisher intervals. They're, but a Fisher interval is really just a T confidence interval by another name. The order difference report is going to order all the groups or all the confidence intervals by the biggest effect down to the smallest effect. And again, this is in terms of the absolute value. So if you wanted to do Atkins minus zone, you would just put a negative sign in front of the difference and a negative sign on the lower and the upper bound. So zone versus Atkins is the largest observed difference in our sample means. Zone has a different is has an observed difference in the change in BMI that is 1.12 larger than the Atkins. Ornish has a Ornish versus Learn has the smallest observed difference, and that is a, one, a 0.15 BMI points uh, change in the BMI points. So these are the two that are most that are the least distinguishable in terms of the difference or the impact on change in BMI. And Zone and Atkins are the two that are most distinguishable. We have this. We have all of the confidence intervals. So we can see that in terms of the distance from zero, because zone versus Atkins is the biggest effect, the confidence interval is the, for zone versus Atkins is the one that is farthest away from zero. Because Ornish and Learn is the one that is closest to zero, it does in fact contain zero and it is the one that is most set, the closest to being centered around zero. Some things to note about the Fisher interval. Each Fisher interval has 95% confidence of containing the true mean difference. That is, if I want to estimate the true mean difference between the LEARN and the Atkins diet, I have 95% confidence that the true mean difference is contained between 0 0.04 and 1.4. If I want to estimate the true mean difference between the zone, Atkins, the zone and Atkins diets, then I have 95% confidence that the true mean difference in the change in BMI is between 0.4 and 1.8. So if I'm doing a Fisher interval, the only thing that's changed is getting the standard error of the difference from jump. The interpretation and the meaning is unchanged. In the next video, I'm going to show how we can do maybe a better job of using our confidence level to control for um, our type 1 error rate when we're building so many intervals at once.